I have as my guest a man who's been a sports talk show host for years. He's heard around the country, and he's currently based in Las Vegas. And that's where we're interviewing him right now, looking out at the great Las Vegas strip of world-class hotels and casinos. His name, Papa Joe Chevalier. If you could talk about where you grew up and what got you into sports broadcasting. Well, I was born in Huntington, West Virginia, but at age 12, uh, 13 roughly, we moved to uh, Pittsburgh. My father got a promotion and we went to Pittsburgh and uh, it was good for me because I grew up and was familiar with Pittsburgh sports. And then I went to uh, school at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh and then got a UPI sports writing job, started covering sports in Pittsburgh and uh, the rest is history. Although I left Pittsburgh because I couldn't take the weather. My parents had moved to Florida and I came here on vacation playing golf. The sun was always shining everywhere, but in Pittsburgh. <laughs> So I decided, decided I had to go where the sun shone. I came out here. When I drove out here, I was, didn't know whether I was going to live in Vegas, Phoenix, L.A. I knew the sun was going to shine wherever I wound up. So I wound up here, and uh, it's been a great place for me. And that's Las Vegas. Now, yeah. which networks have you been on, and where are you heard right now, Papa? Well, we were, we were started as the Sports Entertainment Network in Las Vegas. That's something very few people, very few people know, is that... 24-hour-a-day sports talk was born in Las Vegas, not in New York, not in L.A., but it was the Sports Entertainment Network, the idea of a couple gentlemen here. We started here, then we got bought out by One-on-One -on -one Sports of Chicago, and they asked me to move to Chicago. They told me I only had to go there for a year. Mm. It's one of the great lies ever told. <laughs> And uh, I bought it, and then every time my contract would come up, they would give me a raise, and they kept me there, kept me there. Ten years went relatively quickly. Finally, I decided uh, enough is enough. If you want my show, take it from Las Vegas. And I left and came back here. And now we're syndicating and doing the show from Las Vegas, where I had lived for 17 years after coming from Pittsburgh, 10 years in Chicago, then back to here. Where'd Papa Joe come from, Papa? I wish I could take credit because it's been a great marketing coup for us, but uh, it wasn't my idea. Uh, it was uh, a song that was sent to us. That I think it's the Shirelles or the Chiffons. I get it mixed up. One of them down at Papa Joe's. It's about New Orleans, a famous bar. I've been there a few times. Papa Joe's on Bourbon Street. And uh, it was, so down at Papa Joe's, we play it as Rejoined Bumper. A guy called up and said, hey, Papa Joe. I said, well, no, no, just Joe. <laughs> I said, he said, no, it fits, Papa Joe. Another caller, another caller. Within a couple of months, I was Papa Joe. Papa Joe, you are. And as you mentioned, you're from the Pittsburgh area. Talk about the Steelers' Super Bowl win recently, which is their sixth title, and how you think that these Steelers, the ones that just won here in February 2009, compare with the 1970s Steeler teams. I think they're good. I don't think they're as good as the 70s Steelers. The 70s Steelers were so dominant defensively that uh, the other team, and I'm going to say this honestly, really didn't have a chance. They didn't give anybody a chance to beat them. Uh, they had five shutouts one year, which is un unheard of. And the rules were even changed about that 70s team for, for holding offensively. They let offensive linemen hold their hands out. They never let them do that. But the Steelers rush could not be stopped. It was that superior. And they had a little better, I think, a little better offense with Bradshaw and Swan and Franco and all those guys. This is a fine team, and if it continues to win, I think it will rank right up there. But... Uh, yeah, six, uh, six wins in seven Super Bowl attempts. That's pretty impressive. Not bad. Where were you, Papa, when uh, Franco Harris's miracle happened back in 1972? In the press box. Right there in the press box. How about uh, that? At uh, Three Rivers Stadium. And it was just a, uh, well, it was an unbelievable moment. And I could have been on the press elevator going down with Art Rooney, the owner, who never saw the play. He was on the elevator going down to congratulate his team on a fine, fine season. He knew they were losers that day, but it was so great season. He was gonna, so he's on the press elevator going down when that play happened. When he got to the bottom, they all started hugging him and going crazy, and he realized something had happened. What most people don't remember about that is that that was not a Steelers Super Bowl year. The Immaculate Reception happened, and the next week, the perfect Miami team came to Pittsburgh uh, which back then is strange because they had a better record than Pittsburgh, but back then they did it just by uh, rotation. Mm -hmm. So here comes Shula to Pittsburgh the following week, and not only did he bring his team, but he brought like 65-degree weather in, uh. in December uh -oh. to Pittsburgh. I knew uh, maybe God was on his side, and they won. Larry Seifel did a fake punt, 
turned the game around and Miami beat Pittsburgh in that game. I think Pittsburgh would have won the Super Bowl that year as well, but they weren't they weren't ready. So, uh, Papa, and I know you remember this, that day, which I believe was December 31st of 1972, uh, which was a uh, Sunday, if my memory is correct, I believe uh-huh, is right, yeah. the darkest day in Pittsburgh history. You know about the Steelers losing to the Dolphins, which was very, very small compared to what they found out later in the day, which was? Roberto Clemente, flying a mercy mission to Nicaragua, died late that night, uh, fine food, medicine, clothing to Nicaragua. He was that kind of man, my hero, always growing up. And uh, just, yeah, talk about a dark day. Pittsburgh was in shock, stunned. And it was an amazing, amazing day. And uh, no matter what tribute they pay to him, they can't go overboard. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. Now, let me ask you this big question. Which was bigger in Pittsburgh history, Franco Harris's miracle or Bill Mazeroski's home run in 1960 to win the World Series over the Yankees? This is tough. But I was not there in 1960. I was, we were still in Huntington, West Virginia. So it, while it was a big moment, and of course I was watching, the nuns let us watch uh, a little black and white TV, even in Huntington, West Virginia, World Series, and we got to see it. But it was the trip, uh, it was in Pittsburgh, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't really, I can't even say Franco's catch was a bigger moment. The first Super Bowl victory after 40 years, 40 years mm-hmm. of the Steelers being losers, was really, really sweet, and I was able to be at that game at the uh, Sugar Bowl yeah. in uh, New Orleans, and 16-6 uh, to 6 victory over Minnesota, and uh, just uh, fantastic. To me, that may be even a sweeter moment, although Franco's moment was indeed uh, immaculate. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Meanwhile, there's the Pirates in the Pittsburgh area, World Series winners in 1971 and 1979, hardly been heard from since. What caused the downfall of this once proud franchise? Money. Money is the easiest reason. In 19, if you remember, 1990, 1991, the Pirates won the division with uh, Bayroid Bonds, although I don't think he was using it at the time. He was a rather normal-sized fellow, but a great player. Yeah. And uh, Bobby Bonilla, Drebeck, Lean, Lavalier. All those guys were pirates, and they won the division. And uh, you may remember the Braves beating them in the uh, in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, all those guys went. Bonilla, Bonds, they all left for big money. Yeah. Bonds, after saying he would never leave, of course, boom. First, they free, so he <laughs> saw the check and went zoom. So, <laughs> yeah. so he was gone, and the Pirates have never recovered from that. They don't have much money. They can't compete, certainly, with the Yankees or Boston, those teams. But... Uh, and they've made some mistakes. I'll be honest enough to tell you, the Pirates have made some uh, pickup uh, players make mistakes there. So it's been 16 years in a row of losing seasons. If they lose this season, it will be a major, major league baseball record for losing seasons. Which is coming up 2009. Mm-hmm. Now, how about that uh, Tony Dorsett-led Pitt football team and college football that won the national title in 1976? That was uh, quite a thing. I covered all four years of Dorsett. I was at every game, every home game. And uh, one of the most, the biggest memories for me was how he tortured Notre Dame. Uh, the two years in Pittsburgh and the two years at South Bend, Dorsett just drove Notre Dame crazy. He yeah, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand yards for the four games. I'm not sure, but it was an incredible performance day in and day out. And he was the difference. Johnny Majors brought him in from, uh, I think it was Newcastle, could be Ambridge, Pennsylvania, a, a northern suburb. And uh, what, a, what a get he was. And uh, he had assistant coaches like uh, Jackie Sherrill. And all these guys ended up with other ho- coaching jobs. And Johnny Majors uh, ensured his legend. But, uh, no, it was fun watching Pitt. And, again, Pitt had been a good football program over the years, up and down, up and down, up and down. Never there. But uh, when I first came to Pittsburgh, they were, they were ranked 1, 2, and 3 with Navy and Texas. So it's, oh, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't so startling that Pitt was a contender. Yeah. But it was amazing they won the championship. Then in the early uh, late 70s, early 80s with Dan Marino, they made a great run. Uh, and I, I always look back to this, the 1981 college football season. I'm a diehard Nebraska football uh-huh. fan. I grew up in Omaha, diehard Husker fan. Nebraska would have had two losses. Penn State had two losses, if you recall, the 1981 season. Pitt only had one. They got smashed by Penn State on Thanksgiving weekend. Uh-huh. So who would, if Nebraska would have beat Clemson that year, which they didn't do, Clemson won and, and certainly stopped all the r- rumors. But if Nebraska would have won, who 
would have been number one? Would you have given it to Pitt, who got hammered by Penn State, although they beat Georgia? Would you have yeah, given it to Texas? Yeah. Do you remember that back I that season? I don't have a fond record. I mean, I don't have a good recollection of that, I have to say. Okay. Um, I don't remember it being that much of a controversy, do you? Well, Clemson won, so there was none. Yeah. So yeah. Clemson won, and so it was over. But if yeah, Nebraska yeah. would have beaten them, who would have been number one? I mean, maybe Nebraska would have been. Ugh. Sure. Anyway. Who knows? Anyway, all the great quarterbacks that have come out of Western Pennsylvania, Papa, and I know you know these names, uh, Namath, Marino, uh, Jim Kelly, Joe Montana. Why so many great quarterbacks out of that area? Uh, well, Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio is just was the bedrock of football. It was always, and they had great coaching there. And coaching is what put them ahead. Texas was the only state that could compete with Pennsylvania and Ohio back then. Still, those areas produced players, but now it's spread out. This coaching has spread out throughout the country. Florida now produces a lot of players. California produces a lot of players. But back then, uh, it was it was Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio. I've always said if you put a compass point down, like on Steubenville, and drove a, and put a hundred mile circle around there, you'd have so many great names. It would take all day to name them. Now, what's Namath, there? Kelly, Marino, Montana, Namath, and Mont. I mean, and yeah, in Montana. And I can name a lot more. Sure. I mean, Larry uh, Brown was from there. I know a couple of Tony Dorsett, of course. And Tommy Clemens and, okay. and Terry Hanratty. There you go. Okay. Pirate, the Steelers now with Charlie Batch. And there, there are more that you just fade in memory. But it was just an unbelievable area. And if you go into eastern Ohio, you add a lot more names. It's Absolutely. It's just an amazing area. The uh, top states as far as recruiting, I think ESPN took a poll on this recently. The number one state is Texas, mm -hmm. followed by Florida, California, Ohio right. is ranked fourth. Right. All right. Talk some sports issues with you here, Papa. 2009 sports issues. My guest here is sports talk show host, Papa Joe Chevalier, syndicated around the country and around the world. Pete Rose, Papa, does he belong in the Hall of Fame or not? I think he does. Uh, I think he belongs in the Hall of Fame. I don't think he belongs within a mile of baseball because he has not cleaned up his ways. He, he, you know, he finally admitted it after 10, 15 years of lying. Uh, he finally admitted it. I think what he did on the baseball field has never been sullied. In other words, he did what he did, and he was 4,000 hits, and he belongs with the best players ever. Uh, as a he, as a gambler, you can't defend that. And you can't, had he ran in the, way, the first charge, he should have said, I'm sorry, I'm sick. And that's as much a sickness as any other. And he said, I would have said, he said, I'm sick and I'm cleaning up my ways. Not only didn't he do that, but he denied it for years and he hasn't cleaned up his ways. You find him right now if you go to Caesar's Palace, probably betting something. Really? But uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. he's there all the time. What steroid use uh, done to baseball, do you think? I think it's destroyed the record book if you want if you think that baseball records are important and I do I'm a traditionalist uh, it's destroyed those either you're going to have to eliminate all the steroid users from the record book so that I don't have to compare uh, Barry Bonds and Henry Aaron who did it without help uh, because it's just unfair it's yeah. simply unfair Barry Bonds went from never hitting 40 home runs to hitting 70 Okay, so, I mean, what, what, what are we supposed to make out of that? Does that really go in the record book? Not in my record book. And on our show, we say Roger Maris is the single-season home run champion and Henry Aaron is the career home run champion. We will say that until somebody does it cleanly. Now, speaking of the home run uh, uh, over one season, you mentioned Maris. Mark McGuire, of course, broke that record in 1998 right. and then did, did it also in 99. So you've got McGuire, Sosa, Clemens, Palmero, A-Rod now, Bonds, all have supposedly used steroids. Any of these guys you think going into the Hall of Fame, they're going to put them in or not? As far as I'm concerned, they ought to draw a line. They should say no. They should, they should once they are proven or believed very strongly to have used, and I think they will prove that Bonds used it eventually. They have testimony that he used it. Matter of fact, they have four tests that prove that he used it. He still denies it. So, but um, certainly they were great players. They were great players without steroids. But once you cheat, how can we rely on your numbers? How can we make your numbers real? And uh, unless they can find a way to do that, I just heard an interview last night with Brad Ausmus of the Dodgers. And they asked him point blank, did you use? And there was a, a deafening silence. And he goes, well, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Huh. Now, well, that's a, I just went cha-ching, Brad Osmus, okay? Yeah. And, and, and he's a 10-year man now. Sure. And uh, then he came up with a couple of lame excuses for using it. He said, imagine if you were in a, 
a, a race and people said if you win the race you get ten million dollars if you if you lose the race you get nothing what and but if you take this shot you're you're probably going to win the race and he made that as an example now it's tough to argue that logic but it's it's uh, illicit it's it's illegal so how can you defend it at the same time and I just hope they're able to release the names of these other 103 on the list, let us know who they are, and let, all, let, it, let us wash our hands of this someday, eventually. But they shouldn't just brush it under the rug, which they tried to do. Absolutely. What was your take on the Michael Phelps uh, possible marijuana situation? No big thing. I wouldn't have made a big thing out of it. Uh, I hope he's not an irresponsible, uh, just an idiot. His word, not mine. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, uh, you know, he got busted for DUI. Then he got busted now for the, the pot thing. Right. And he, you know, he comes out and says, I'm sorry, I hurt a lot of people, and I'm, I'm an idiot. Uh, but you don't know. At 23 years old, he'd just been handed probably $50 million. And I don't know how you could get anybody back in the pool for that rigorous training after that. But uh, we'll see. I think time will judge. I'm not ready to let him off the hook. And it certainly, Kellogg's didn't let him off the hook. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't going to let him off. The USA Swimming suspended him for three months. Uh, so there is punishment. To be, I'm glad there is, and then we'll see from now on. But he's he really will have to lead the straight and narrow. Absolutely. Moving on to other sports issues here. Enjoy talking to Papa Joe Chevalier here, great sports talk show host around the country. Papa, how do you feel about college football's BCS? It's an abomination to have a, a, a year when four, five, six teams could qualify and be the best team in the country, and yet two are picked, to, and arbitrarily picked at that. There's no real rating system that you can use. I mean, every you know, rate schedules, and I think schedule strength of schedule is is very important to this. But even if you do, sometimes it's in the margins. It's close, close, close. So how do you do that? How do you award a national championship? And by the way, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it didn't make much difference because big deal. Now it's millions, tens of millions, 50 million dollars to the winner in in recruiting and in all the benefits from winning. It's too big to leave to some sports writer or some coach who doesn't who gives it to his assistant to vote or any of the other foibles we've seen in the system. It's too important now, and it, I think they have to do a, a playoff. Absolutely. They're talking about the plus one, which is probably going to be the next step, will be yeah. the plus one. And then well, we're there. dragging them, kicking and screaming. Oh, yeah. We, we now have a playoff for the championship. Remember, we didn't have this. They just right. voted number one. Now we have one versus two. What would you call that? That's a playoff. Absolutely. One versus two. Yeah. All they have to do is open their minds a little bit further <laughs> right. and expand the number of teams, and we'd have a legit playoff. Moving on here. How about replay in sports? So your thoughts. Do you like it? Hate it. Oh, I love it. Well, there. So, <laughs> so you're not right on everything. <laughs> no, no. I Listen, I understand that it can improve some facets of the game. Anybody can see that. But my point, and I make this often on the show, probably uh, eyes glaze over because I say it probably a couple times a week. You're changing the game to the TV truck. You're not allowing the humans to do it anymore. Uh, whether it's a knee touching a blade of grass, an 800th of a second before the ball came loose, that can't, game can't be refereed. There's no referee that can see that. When they say the referee missed the call, he didn't miss a thing. You can't see that kind of stuff. So they changed the game. The dimension of the game has been changed. It's now when you're watching a game, admit it, Oh, we need to replay that. We need to replay that. We need to replay that's the that's not even the football game anymore. It's the replay. And uh, I'm afraid that it's so pervasive that I that it will continue to expand because people will say, "Well, if you do it for this, why didn't you do it for this?" And you've already heard the commissioner this year has said even about a, a remote thing in the football that would beep when it when it touched the goal line, and another beeper, 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 beeper. <laughs> How do we get by with it for a hundred years oh. without replay? Okay, and I, you know, bad breaks were bad breaks. Now people don't want to accept bad breaks, except they still happen. You and I sit down and watch a game, and I'll show you ten things that could be reviewed, but they don't review those, so they only want to be so fair because they're not going to review that. Well, what's that? <laughs> you know, we're going to be a little bit more fair, but we don't want to be all the way fair. What what kind of logic is that? So I've never bought into it, and I'm an old timer. I'm a purist. I'm a traditionalist. I say just take your breaks as they come. You know, uh, I like I said, I, I was favoring uh, replay because it's probably cost my two favorite teams in this world 
the Nebraska football corn Huskers, St. Louis Cardinals baseball, each at least one championship. Don Dinkinger, Absolutely. the Roy, and then Nebraska. They might have bad calls against Penn State back in 82, if anybody remembers that. And then the Orange Bowl against Florida State, January 1 of 94. Uh, William Floyd crosses a goal. But, you know, I guess things even out. Well, you remember those, and you don't remember all the ones that went in your favor. Yeah, there, there were some that, that, that did I, that, too. I'm sure yeah. they did. Oh, yeah. All right, talk about the upcoming baseball season. Uh, Papa, what do you like uh, coming up? Well, I'll tell you what, I thought the California Angels were the best team last year, and they blew a tire coming down the stretch, didn't win in the playoffs, and uh, I thought they were the best team. They look like a very, very good team again this year. I hate to say the Yankees, <coughs> but uh, the, the Yankees had spent uh, $233 million more million in the offseason, and uh, they're so desperate to win now. You know, they've got their lineup loaded again. There are eight players, I don't know if you're aware of this, there are eight starting players, forget pitchers, there are eight starting players make more than every complete roster but three in baseball. Wow, what are those That's three just teams? There are eight players. Boston's one, I'm, I think. The I Cubs, think maybe? The Detroit, Detroit Tigers are another, believe it or not. Okay. Detroit was the second team, by the way, this year to qualify for the salary luxury tax. There you go. So they're spending money over there in Detroit. Sure. And uh, I'm not, I can't remember the other one, but three teams only make more with their whole 25 men oh. roster than the Yankees' eight, eight starting men. Well, that's, that's ludicrous. And to a Pirates fan, it has to be changed. I, absolutely. I, you know, you look at Tampa Bay, you look at Philadelphia, but somehow teams don't repeat as much anymore. There's, in this decade, since 2000, uh, only Boston has won twice. So it, it could be wide open and up in the air. Maybe the Angels, who you just talked about, maybe the Dodgers, if they sign Manny, that could be interesting. Well, the Cubs are trying to win. You look at the playoffs, and the Yankees were there 13 consecutive years. It wasn't because they're smarter. It's because they had a payroll that kept them always in the hunt. They don't win it. They haven't been winning it lately, but they're always in the hunt. I mean, Pirates and a lot of other teams are not in the hunt in, uh, right now. Yeah. They're going to camp and they're not in the hunt. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 yeah I, I read exactly what you're saying. College basketball, uh, who cuts the cords as national titleists come April? Well, I would have said Connecticut, uh, but I'll tell you what, you can't replace uh, size, and I love, I love Hansborough. Now, Connecticut has size, but I'm just saying Hansborough to me, and that team's been together. They've got a great coach, and beating Duke at Duke, Four straight years. Oh. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I sure. Mean, you can't even think anybody could do that. Well, so I'll go with Carolina right right now. And it could, be, you know, if you, there's a, a number of good teams. Uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, is a good club. Uh, Villanova's a coming team that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. They're getting better as the weeks go by. And uh, there's any number of others. But uh, if you point a gun at me. And you aren't, aren't you? Well, no, I'm not. No, no, no. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, all right, I'll stick with uh, the heels. All right, there you go. How about the NBA? Who uh, plays for the crown come June? Lakers and uh, Celtics again? Yeah, yeah, I'll just say that. I mean, I don't know if anybody could get injured or upset, and the loss of Bynum was supposed to kill the Lakers for a while. But what happened? They went to Boston to beat Boston and went to Cleveland to beat Cleveland. Right. So evidently they're still good enough. And, yeah, if, if you had been in a coma for 30 years and you woke up and somebody said the Lakers in Boston, you'd go, Wait a minute. I was asleep for that. <laughs> I know. And now here they nothing, are. Nothing changed. Nothing, nothing changed. changed. How about the NHL? Well, I, again, my Penguins, I would have picked at the beginning of the season, coming off last year, but they've evidently they've lost their heart. They, they lost five players, and I, so I think they've lost their heart. And now, of course, Detroit just looks, just looks almost unbeatable. It's close to a, now uh, San Jose is looking great, but they're playing in the West, and I'm not sure they're being challenged enough. But uh, San Jose only had uh, eight losses uh, the other day. Pittsburgh beat them in a shootout, and they had eight losses. Six of them were in overtime. They've only lost twice in regular regulation play. That's amazing. Exactly. Now, you've worked in and around several cities around the U.S., Papa. Describe the sports scene real quickly and, support of, uh, and fan support in these cities. Start with L.A. What kind of sports uh, town do you think L.A. is? It's mild compared to uh, the eastern cities. Uh, the problem with Los Angeles, Phoenix, Las Vegas even, if we had a team, everybody's from somewhere else. In Pittsburgh, you've got generation after generation growing up as Pirate fans, as Steeler fans, as whatever. Uh, New York, same way, Philadelphia, Detroit, Cleveland. Those are long, such long time, and they build not only a, a fan base, but a rabid fan base. I mean, it doesn't matter whether Cleveland loses or Pittsburgh loses. The fans are always going to be there. Philadelphia, their fans are as rabid as any. Los Angeles, you go and 
you can see half the stands wearing Yankee hats when right. the Yankees are there. Oh, yeah. Now, that's that. there'd be a riot if that happened in a lot of eastern cities. Oh, sure. I'm not knocking Los Angeles. They do drive me a little crazy with uh, beach balls. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, watch the game, will you? And oh, if yeah. the beach ball is between me and the great play, you may have trouble on your, on your hands. <laughs> but uh, uh, tepid uh, would be a good word. Lukewarm. And when they win, of course, they're there. I think the Lakers have great fans. They've built those over a long time. Absolutely. I, I've always felt Los Angeles is a Laker town first. I mean, the Dodgers are great. USC is great. UCLA. But it just seems like the Lakers turn the town on the most as far as sports. Chicago is a great sports oh, town, it isn't is. it, Papa? It is, sure. And, I mean, they got people living by Wrigley Field who are in the fifth generation of their family living by Wrigley Field. <laughs> they don't even move these people and I know people in Pittsburgh the same way so again it's it takes time and it takes being a Pittsburgher being a Chicagoan being a Clevelander you're that and you're right. that and your generations of your family are that you've got to get that now I'm sure there is a Los Angeles base of fans and the Dodgers have great fans oh, and yeah. the Angels are building a base better all the time in Orange County but everybody's from somewhere else right exactly when you get to the second and third and fourth and fifth generations there now you've got fans. That's Those exactly are real right. fans. Is Las Vegas a big town uh, for for? Or is is this going to be a big league city? You think in the next ten years? I think that within ten years, the leagues will come to us. We won't have to ask them anymore. If we keep growing as a city, and we are, uh, even with this economic downturn, uh, as we keep growing, I mean we're reaching two million. How many two million man markets are there? There aren't many. And as this continues to grow, and we need to build a first-class facility, both indoor and outdoor, they will come knocking on our door, especially the NBA and the NHL will come knocking on our door. The NFL, they really, they really have a dislike of Las Vegas. They think gambling, which in fact built the NFL, is the, big, is the enemy of the NFL. They've got that exactly backwards. How about baseball coming to Vegas? I think it would be perfect here. Absolutely. You'd have to build a domed indoor stadium because it's too hot here in the summertime, just like Phoenix. But if we build a proper stadium, I, again, build it and they will come. I think that's true here. And again, we're probably the biggest market. We're bigger than some markets that have pro teams, and we're growing to be even bigger. So I think they'll come knocking on our door. Talk some of the history now with you, Papa, if you could. Give me who you think is the best NFL team over one season ever. I'm going to say the 78 Steelers. What do you say? I think you're right. I absolutely think the 78-79 uh, version of that team was as close to unbeatable, uh, again, uh, as any team. Uh, I, I could name a few that are close. I mean, the 85 Bears were remarkable. But again, they didn't have a, a great One hit wonder, though, That's for them. Right. And, and to me, you've got to win more than once. Right. You've got to be New England. You've got to be Pittsburgh and win more than once. Not back-to-back -back years, but in your, in your right. window. Right, right. You've got to win more than once. And I think that's what the Steelers won twice, lost two years, and then won twice more. Right. So, I mean, that's four out of six. That shows that they're their pedigree. Go back to the Packer teams. Uh, the great Packer teams, they were certainly ranked up there. And... Uh, I, you know, the Giants, if, I thought the Giants would win this year. Going in, I was sure. And then I, was, I watched them play in the first half of the season. They looked like the most professional, classy football team I'd seen. Thought they would win again. They, you know, ended up stumbling at the end. But uh, the loss of uh, the genius, Plexico Burris, yeah. who, who shot himself in the thigh and a team in the foot. <laughs> all, all at one time. That's quite a shot. How about that? How about the best Major League Baseball team over one season, Papa? Wow. Well, I, I would. I know the Yankee fans would all argue with me whether they say the '27 Yankees or all those teams. Uh, I think they they all those Yankees. There's four or five Yankee editions that would would belong up there. <sighs> I, I, I was I, I interviewed Bill James, who did the baseball abstract. You've yeah, heard of him sure, on this program. I've interviewed Bill, and he was saying statistically, let's say since 1970, uh, the best teams were like the '70 Orioles, the '76 Reds, '84 Tigers, red '98 machine. Yankees. '75 Reds sounds good, but, I, yeah, but as far yeah. as pre 1970, I know the '27 Yankees, the '61 Yankees are always mentioned. Right, right. right. Those are, they all belong, and uh, again, uh, you have to you have to do it more than once. Well, they did it a lot. <laughs> a lot. How about best NBA team over one season that you can think of? Well, I think the Lakers uh, were the best team. The Magic Lakers, the Showtime Lakers, right. were the best I'd ever seen and the most fun to watch. 
uh, the way they the way they would get the ball out and go with it were, were just uh, so much fun to watch. The Celtics, of course, would argue that the, the, the Bill Russell teams were the greatest, and I I can't really argue the point. But I know the Lakers were both great and so enjoyable to watch. 85-86 Celtics. That was a team that I always ranked very high among the great teams of all time. Two 13-game winning streaks, won the NBA title, Bird and McHale and Parrish and Ainge and that group. That, the, it was the, the, those, the, the NBA in the 80s with the Lakers and the Celtics really went to another level. Yeah, and absolutely. we haven't seen basketball absolutely. like it since. I mean, we had Jordan, but, but no big rivalry like that, that that you really look forward to. No, and I, the Philadelphia 76ers had a great team. Uh, you, the, when Wilt was there, and, 67. Uh, and Lucius Jackson and Hal Greer, they were fantastic. They were a dominant, dominant team. But again, not for, not over a long period of time. Absolutely. Just how about college football over one season? Uh, I hope you're going to say my 1995 Nebraska Corn Huskers. I'll tell you what, I couldn't help but mention them in any list. You, you have to say uh, <laughs> they're just just a fabulous team. That offensive line was the most impressive I think I'd ever seen. The defense didn't have much of a chance. They they ran where they wanted to run. When they wanted to run, they were a fine, fine team. And uh, um, I, picking any of the others, of course, the the, the Notre Dame Michigan State game, the 10-10 tie for the national title, that produced like 11 professional football players out it. of that one game. I believe both it. Both sides can, can combined was unbelievable. The Nebraska Oklahoma game was the greatest I ever saw. What was it? Hey, 73? 1971, Thanksgiving 71, Day. Okay. I interviewed Jerry Taggy, who was the quarterback of Nebraska on that program, and Johnny Rogers, I interviewed on this program too. And he, of course, returned the punt. That was uh, the two teams undefeated going in, Big Eight title on the line. Um, the national championship, really, and then Nebraska ended up number one. They won that game, finished right, number one, right. and Oklahoma number two. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. And wasn't that Colorado three? They were three. Thank you very much. You <laughs> not, know it. Not a bad year for the big Hey, game. yeah, great year. USC in 72, awesome. 04 USC, oh, also yeah. awesome. And this yeah. run by Pete Carroll is sure something else. No, absolutely. And he, I thought he deserved another shot. The people in the West, and I was one of them, thought he deserved another shot this year. Had we had a playoff, they could have won the whole thing. Their defense, and this is an unbelievable statistic, may put nine people in the NFL. I believe it. That's amazing. On that 95 Nebraska team, the defense, I think 12 of the top 15 players played in the NFL. Several go. of them were Super Bowl stars. College basketball over one season. I always debate uh, probably that 1973 UCLA team with Bill Walton, undefeated in the midst of the 88-game winning streak and all that. What, what do you say? Do you, you see another team maybe? No, you, you got me there. I think you're right because not only was the 73 team the best, but Walton put on the best show in a championship game that ever was made. Uh, I think he was 20 for 21 from the field. And those were not dunks. Those were not layups. Those were turnaround jumpers. Exactly. You couldn't dunk them. 21. They were tied at the half. And I'm going to explain in a second why I love this game, team. But anyways, 20 of 21, they were tied at the half and ended up winning by 19. The reason that's important to me I had a big bet uh, on the game. Now, I'm in Las Vegas, but I was in Pittsburgh then. Uh -huh. But I think the statute of limitations has run out. Uh, I don't think I can be prosecuted. But the but I had a big bet with five or six of my college buddies. We're sitting in an apartment. We all had bets on UCLA. Tied at the half. We were glum at the half. They went wild in the second half. Walton was the best, the best, one of the best, if not the best college player I ever saw. Just an amazing passer, court presence, just. Just remarkable, and the show he put on to win that. But I'll, I'll rank them. Of course, I'll go back further even to Cincinnati. Sure. The, the Cincinnati Cubs with the big O. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Ohio State had great teams back then. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll go with that UCLA club. You know, um, Bobby Knight's Indiana team in 76, Absolutely. certainly great Magic Johnson's team. Of course, you had the great UNLV team that almost that did win it in 90, didn't in 91. And then UConn's had some great teams, North Carolina with Jordan, and that sort of thing. John Wooden, I still see him walking around L.A. every once in a while, 98 years old, That's still it. gets around, nice That's guy, it. always great to talk to. Uh, NHL team over one season, uh, I've debated this a little bit with my friend, a co long-time college friend back in St. Louis. Um, he's been watching the Blues for been sure. suffering sure. for years, just as sure. all St. Louis Blues. Are. But over the... As far as an NHL team over one season, how about the Canadians? Or, or, do, you, or do you think Edmonton was better? Le Bleu Blanc à Rouge, uh, the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, uh, I, I think for years, again, you have to look at their dynasty. But uh, if you watch them play, and I had a French-Canadian father, 
who made sure we watched them play oh, okay. as often as possible. But uh, that may be the greatest team. But I, listen, from the Broad Street Bullies to Boston when they were good, all those teams in a given year uh, could have been the greatest team ever. If you're looking for dynasties, of course, uh, Montreal. Absolutely, but, with the uh, 1976 to 79, then of course Edmonton with Gretzky. And the uh, Edmonton team, oh, absolutely. Oh, in the 80s was absolutely. just phenomenal. And Detroit, I mean, they've had a great run, and, and even your even your, your, your Penguin team is sure, also great. Right. Sure. You know, Papa, one great thing that you did, and I, I just love this program. You did it back, I believe it was early August, late July, early August of 2001. One great radio show you did was back then on Sporting News Radio. You did a special on the 80-year anniversary of Major League Baseball play-by-play -play on the radio. It was so great to listen to. You had some great guests. Talk about that day. Well, that was fun for me. Again, I, I keep repeating, I'm a traditionalist, a purist, and those guys were the best in their business. The guys who grew up doing television never perfected the art of drawing the pictures. So whether it's uh, Ernie Harwell or Bob Prince or uh, Wade Hoyt in Cincinnati, who we used to listen to, and uh, any uh, Harry Carey, Jack Buck, and all these guys who started on radio were the very, very, very best. And uh, I'm, I'm, if I'm leaving names out, uh, uh, we're, we're going to get to a bunch of names here in just Red a second. Bar, those, but they're all, they were all great. I used to sit there. I used to have a little transistor under my pillow at night. And we could, in Pittsburgh, we could even get, we could get uh, Philadelphia, uh, Harry Callis. We could, we could get uh, Cleveland. We could get Chicago. At night, those 50,000 watt Westinghouse stations, you could get them all over the East. And I would pick, and of course, our own Bob Prince, I thought was uh, one of the best, the, the most colorful. I mean, absolutely. And Vin Scully out West is just uh, incredible. Speaking of, I've got a bunch of sportscasters here I'd like to get your opinion on. I, 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 I hear you talk about them once in a while. And I'm going to start with, it's time for Dodger Baseball. <laughs> Vin Scully, your thoughts on him? Farmer John's hot dog. Farmer John. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, well, he's just a classy guy. Uh, he's different from, he's, he's not a homer, although if you listen you know, for a while, you know which team he's for, but he's not a homer. He's right. not like Harry Carey. Well, Harry oh. Carey would be going crazy. Yeah. But I, but I love that style as well. Bob Prince was another guy. Mm -hmm. But but no, Vince Scully's uh, dulcet tones, uh, you know, you, don't even, you didn't even want, like they say about Dodger fans, you don't know it's official until you hear Harry, until you hear Vinny say it. And they all brought the radios to the stadium mm -hmm. so they could listen to him describe what was in front of their eyes. They right. They to hear his description. Right. So, uh, no, he's just a, a class act, and uh, I, I can't, I don't believe how long he'll do it. I mean, I, I thought he'd be gone by now. 80, 81 years old. Yeah, this is going to be his 60th year, I believe, coming up in 2009. Yeah, yeah no, he, he deserves, again, all the praise he gets. How about this one? Uh, you, you, you mentioned him a moment ago. As he has said, here's the pitch. No, Jack Buck. <laughs> no, Jack Buck. Uh, when he was with Harry, there was an unmatchable cub, uh, pair. In, Bob Costas in called them the best two-man booth ever. Absolutely. There's no question about it. And I would listen to them, KMOX. I would listen to them uh, in Pittsburgh. And, uh, again, they were just the best. I don't know whether I differentiate. I mean, one, again, Harry was a big, big homer. And you enjoyed him, his homerism. Jack Buck wasn't so much, but he was uh, just a class. In other words, a classy guy. Doing a, uh, I shot dice with him once at the Aladdin Hotel up here. Oh, Jack who, Buck. oh yeah. What what year was this? It was event? on the same. Well, this was way back. Seventies, eighties. Late, it's late seventies, early eighties. Okay, so. yeah. He was always telling stories that when he was in San Francisco or had come to Los Angeles, San Diego, he'd hop a plane over here to Vegas to. Uh, he was a player. To play a little bit. How about his son Joe? What do you think of Joe? Not so much, but again, he's the TV generation, and they don't—they're—they're they're not relied on so much to give you the description, to to paint the pictures. I don't. Uh, most modern announcers, I find that way. Not really a knock, but it's a, it's just a difference, really. How about Dick Enberg? Holy cow! Uh, I think uh, I think he's good. I think he's professional. I don't. He doesn't knock my socks off like some, but I think he did a fine job. Kurt County. Same thing. Same exact thing. Very professional. Keith Jackson. More, he was more fun to listen to. Uh, his his southern witticisms or expressions were priceless. And uh, I, again, he's still doing it, isn't he? he was, yeah, well, he's he, still doing some games. Well, he, he still does some talk shows. He doesn't do games anymore. Oh, okay. he, he's not that, but he does. How about Al Michaels? I like him. I like he and Madden together. I think is a good team. Uh, I think Madden may have lost a little bit over time, but he's still he's colorful. 
And I think Michael's, again, another extreme professional. How about Jim Nance? I love him. I absolutely love him. I think he's so good at the Masters, uh, which, by the way, he told me in an interview is his uh, favorite event over the Super Bowl. He preferred the Masters. He's a, a golf golfer from the University of Houston. I don't know if you know that about oh, yeah. Nance. But, uh, and I, uh, I was scheduled to play with him at the Greater Greensboro, and it, we got rained out. But I sat with him and talked for a while, and he's just... Just, again, class. I keep using the word, but you notice it when you see it. And uh, just a very, very classy guy and a consummate professional as well. Papa Joe Chevalier, I've been wanting to talk to you for years. Howard Cosell, what do you think of Howard? <laughs> the only guy who bought a toupee and changed his name so he could tell it like it is. <laughs> That's a great, okay. That's interesting. Bob Costas. Another great guy. I love him. And I love him as much because he's a baseball guy. When they work him into other sports, I, you know, it leaves me cold. Or, or he's just mediocre. But I think as a baseball man, and now they've moved him back to the baseball network. He just took a job yes, with MLB he did. He, Network. He, he left HBO. He will, yeah. be, he will star there. He will, Absolutely. That's, that, that's his Ballywick. And that's where he started on January 1st of this year, 2009. He was uh, doing the uh, sort of hosting the 1956 World Series, the Larson Perfect Game. He was uh, he had uh, Larson and he had Yogi uh, interviewing them on this MLB yeah, Network. The, which show, is he, the show he did recently uh, on HBO with Aaron and Mays. Uh, uh, that was just a, a classic. And it, that network is going to do very well. Now, here's a man, a play-by-play -play man, or TV man, I think you're going to call him more than anything, who called the greatest game I ever saw live, any sport, 1976, I'm sure you watched it, game number five, Phoenix-Boston, NBA Finals, Brent Musburger announced that game, won by Boston in the triple overtime game over Phoenix, car heard shot going everywhere. What's your thoughts on Brent? I find him... Uh to do good play-by-play -play except when he hyperventilates. And what I mean by that is it seems a little phony. His, the injection of excitement from him seems to be almost planned or choreographed, and sometimes he goes up a notch uh, in volume when it's not called for. Yeah. I don't know whether he's trying to be, he's not a young man, and he's trying to play a little younger than, uh, than he is. But I'll give you my Brent Musburger story. He's the young man, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, who came out of Chicago, mm -hmm. and the Illinois State Basketball Tournament was known as March Madness. How about that? He went to CBS in New York and took the title March Madness with him. Okay. And the people in Illinois are still sore. Oh, I bet, that yeah. Now, Madness that's is, a great story. No longer, no longer the Illinois State Basketball Championship. Speaking of basketball, and a man who worked in Illinois before he became a big star in Los Angeles, Chick Hearn, your thoughts on Chick? Love Chickie Baby. Ah. I always loved him. I always loved him. Uh, uh, I'm sure he was... I, I don't know whether he got so short-tempered with the Lakers, but you could hear his emotions. You know, you could hear when he didn't like a call, didn't like a play, didn't like the way the Lakers were playing... He didn't... The Lakers aren't going to be able to get the ball in bounds here. Come on. Yeah, I've heard him do that. No, he was... He was and so that honesty I loved, and no, I, I really liked him. Yeah, he's an outstanding. Now, who do you think, in, in your opinion, uh, is the best, um, other than you, of course, Papa, where we're not going to deny that, oh, Hell Killer, um, the best sports talk show host in America on radio? Uh, who, who do you think is the best? Uh, Dan Patrick, uh, Jim Rome... Uh, do you go with um, Colin Cowherd, uh, Mike and Mike? Uh, just uh, who would you... If I'm going to tell you something that uh, some people know, close to me, but they don't know, probably don't know. I don't listen to sports talk. Okay. okay. I don't. Okay. I never have. Okay. Um, I listen to political talk. Okay. I, I'm a talk radio fan, but I listen to, started off listening to Rush, and I, I listen to them all now. P political talk uh, interests me more on the radio because, remember... Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mailman, and I don't take a walk on my off day. I see. So when I'm when I'm doing my sports talk, that's my sports there you for go. the day. And I don't really uh, I've I've listened. Don't get me wrong. I've heard them all. Right. But I don't really I'm not really a fan of it. Uh, that may be cutting my own throat. But I but I don't I'm honest enough to tell you. There you go. And I, and, and that's what you do. You always do tell it like it is. And that puts you on the spot here, Papa Joe. I'm talking here with Papa Joe Chevalier, the great. Sports talk show host heard around the country. He's been heard in Los Angeles. He's been heard in New York, Chicago, Sporting News Radio. We're going to talk more about that here in just a little bit. Papa Joe, I'm going to put you on the spot right here and get quick one or two word answers from you, okay? 
quickies, all right? In sports talk, that's almost impossible. I know it is. One or two word answers. Go ahead. One or two word answers. I'm going to hit you with them. Okay, here we go. Greatest sports moment for you? Moment. Yes, that's, greatest that's sports the, moment. Pro, that's the problem for me. Uh, or championship or well, whatever. Well, yeah, I would go with the Steelers' first Super Bowl. That which was the 1974 season, right. beating my Vikings. <laughs> oh, everybody beats. Right? I know. It's so. It's they're a jinx franchise. Vikings and Chiefs are jinx franchises. Two of my favorite teams. You know and what the, the halftime score of that game was? It was uh, two to nothing. Two to nothing. And, and then Bobby Walden uh, had a punt blocked. It was nine to six. Like the ten minutes to go in the game. And I was going nuts, Matt Blair. But then Bradshaw let him down, and they won the game. But that still was the best show of defense by that Steeler team, even over the Bears, I think, in, in the 85 season. The night, the night before at dinner, I, with a room full of Viking fans, uh, in I was in Biloxi, Mississippi, staying there for the World Super Bowl, and I said, Bud Grant or even Ulysses S. couldn't get the Vikings out of this mess. Oh, God. Well, that, that Steeler <laughs> defense. That's a loyal Steeler fan. There you go, but, but that was such a great. Okay, yeah. most heartbreaking sports moment for you. Wow. Wow. I'll tell you what, the, uh, the the San Francisco game jumps to my, I mean, the Atlanta beating Pittsburgh in the playoff game where... Uh, uh, with the two-run, uh, th three-run rally uh, with um, uh, the, Francisco Cabrera of yeah, Atlanta. Cabrera, that's it. The guy, guy's probably driving a, a cab today or whatever, and he beat, the, he beat the Pirates there. That was a, a heartbreaking moment. But if I had more time, I'd probably be able to think of another one. As a sports fan, you, you get a number of heartbreaks. Absolutely, and I've, I've had to. How about best sports city in America? Let me, let me amend that by saying the news of Clemente's death okay. was easily, okay. easily the most heartbreaking Absolutely. moment. Absolutely. Okay, okay, and, and, that, and that's a great thing to say. Uh, best sports city in America? I've always said New say, York because there's more teams and they've had more if titles. If you go by numbers of teams and number of fans, uh, it would probably be New York. I think Philadelphia ranks right there, and I think Chicago ranks right there. If you went sport by sport, again, I think Pittsburgh's football fans are as good as any, but uh, greatest sports city, I mean, there's a number I can eliminate. A lot right. of cities I would say are definitely not, right. but those we mentioned uh, I think all belong. How about best sports announcer of all time, in your opinion? I'll tell you what, I grew up listening to Ray Scott in Green Bay, and he was a Pittsburgh guy, but he did all the Green Bay Packer games. He was just wonderful. Absolutely, and, and he did several Super Bowls, of course, for we, CBS since television. Since we didn't mention him before, he's certainly near the top if he's not at the top of my Everyone list. liked uh, Ray Scott, yeah. And he, he, he did the, I don't know if you remember, a long time ago on the radio, he did a show called Computer Kickoff, which was syndicated, predicted all the games, and the scores were just so crazy. We predict Pitt will beat Navy 11-7. to And it will be Ohio State over Michigan State 18-16. You know, came up with all these crazy we, we scores. We all grew up as NFL fans. The whole country used to see the Green Bay games. Oh, yeah. And it was always Ray Scott. So I think the whole fan, the whole country knew Ray Scott. Probably the, you know, maybe the first seven or eight years of the NFL, maybe along with Kurt Gowdy, yeah. Ray Scott may have been the voice that people remember, That's let's right. say, over the first six or seven mm -hmm. Super Bowls. Be best athlete you ever saw? I'm going to let my heart speak here. Uh, Roberto Clemente. Absolutely. Good good, uh, good answer. Best team in sports history you ever saw over one season? Best team in, in all of sports for yeah. one season? Yeah, over one season. Wow. These are tough. Mm. These are tough because I don't want to short anybody at the right. same time. But uh, I think uh, that Laker team we talked about, the Showtime Lakers. Okay. Would you, would you, would you well, you'd be talking out? like 87, 88, back-to-back -back there, 85. Yeah, those were certainly outstanding. Sure. All right. Uh, best organization in the history of sports. Love them or hate them. <laughs> best organization in the history of sports. Well, I don't. See, I would not give the Yankees that title because they have so much money to spend. Now, that's in more recent times. Right. Uh, I think the Red Sox are, are a good organization as well. Trying to run through my this is tough because I got to run through so many things in my mind. But uh, do you know who's been called the greatest owners in sports history? You can't argue it. They're so well loved. It's family. The Rooney family. Absolutely. Well, certainly, I would mention the Steelers with any group because uh, not only have they won, but they've endured for so long. And this is a team that was bought for twenty-five hundred dollars, 
now worth a billion, and they still didn't sell it. A billion dollars? Wow, I didn't know they were, they were worth Seven, that much. Seven fifty to a billion. Wow. Depending on, uh, you know, they, and they, again, they don't make a lot of money, but the value of the franchise, you know, the brand name thing, mm -hmm. you can't have a better brand name. Is Three River Stadium nicer than this current stadium, or is this current stadium superior to Three Rivers? I, I, I liked Three Rivers over uh, Heinz. Heinz had, I thought it had rather cheap seating when I went there. Okay, not a bad stadium, don't get me wrong, and it's built more for football than Three Rivers. Three Rivers was a multi-purpose. Right. But uh, I'm, I wasn't a big fan of Heinz. On the other hand, PNC, the Pirates' new park, is as, as good, if not the best, in baseball. It's fabulous. It is a, such, such, such a wonderful place. How about the most overrated athlete that you ever saw? Wow. Huh. There's a thousand. <laughs> There's a thousand. Oh, yeah. I, I think anybody that, uh, a lot of guys who play in New York, get overrated because of the fact that the media... Joe Namath. Yeah, well, there you go. But there's a lot of guys who do little, do little, have a little success and get a lot of publicity mm -hmm. uh, because New York's such a media center. You're L.A. Right. is kind of the same way. Uh, over, but overrated? Gee, I'm going to pass. Okay, okay. Long list. Just put a long list. Okay, long list. All right, all right. Getting more to uh, radio right now, talking more radio here with uh, Papa Joe Chevalier, the great sports talk show radio host based in Las Vegas. He's been heard all over the country for many, many years. Okay, as we mentioned, we want to talk more about sports talk radio now and radio in general. How does sports talk of today, Papa, compare to when you first broke in? It's, it's louder. It's uh, more obscene. Uh, uh, it tries to play to, uh, to a young crowd that uh, I think diminishes doing a legitimate sports talk. Uh, I consider my show to be a smart show. And I agree with that, because you talk sports. I, I don't want to hear sports talk guys talk about Britney Spears. I, I like Britney Spears, I do. But sport, no, I, I want to hear them talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers winning the Super Bowl sure. or, the, or, the, or the Lakers sure. going to the NBA and I Finals. I think you can do it smartly without, without screaming. There are some guys who have made a living just screaming at the top of their lungs. I don't know how that impresses anybody. But uh, again, smart sports talk differentiates itself from a lot of modern sports talk. People want to make a name, and so they, they say obnoxious, obscene things, and they get a name. Oh, did you hear what he said? Did you yeah. hear what he said? A month from now, two months from now, how do you top that? And you can't, so you, you, know, you can only say so many words on radio. Go downhill. And then you go right down. What's the future of satellite radio, do you think? I know that the industry's been in trouble, and there are, uh, what, a billion dollars in the hole, satellite radio is being threatened. You're talking XM Sirius? Yeah, 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 just, yeah, in general. I think it's going to be okay. Uh, the problem with both satellite and uh, terrestrial radio is the internet. If indeed the internet continues to grow, and why wouldn't it? Hmm. And they put in, and they put computers in cars, which they tell me they're doing now. Ooh. Terrestrial radio has got problems because if you have a favorite show and you're from Pittsburgh and you can't get the show now on the computer, you can get the show and you can listen to your guy or your gal talk and. Uh, I don't know how you're going to stop internet. I mean, I, I'm on the internet now. We get calls from all over the country, but more from people listening on the internet than on radio stations. You know, what's interesting is uh, the internet has taken away so many jobs from so many people, not just in radio. I'm talking all industries. Mm -hmm. It's done so much to it, and it's just a shame what it's done because it's, people like people. Sure. And, um, and there's tapes on right now, and, and most of the stations around the country, for probably 75% of their day, are running nationally. Like, of course, you were part of that, right, too, right, a sporting, right, which, right, which we're right. going to talk about here. Yeah. Now, what kind of sports talk callers bother you the most? People without anything to say and no way to say it. And uh, we try through screening, and I'm, I'm sure you do the same. If a guy calls up, we try to say, well, what do you want to talk about? And if he tells you what you want to talk about, in that you hear whether he can talk. Okay? I gotcha. Callers have no right to damage your show. They have a right to say what they want to say, but they don't have a right to damage your three hours. So you have to be, sometimes you have to put your foot down and you say, no, we're not talking about that right now. Or, you know, give them a reason. We try to be polite, always try to be polite, because that is the customer. But uh, people who don't speak well, can't speak well, and uh, of course it's better, the more, opportunity, the more cho chances you have, more choices you have, I mean, is if you're getting tons and tons of calls, you can be more selective right. than if you're just getting a few. So 
again, uh, that's what I found at Sporting News. How many uh, calls do you take an hour usually? 10, 12, less? Some, not, some days it's a few, some days it's a lot. Depends on what the subject matter. Now, I've moved into guest radio at least probably a third, uh, half the time is guests. Uh, and again, here is another distinction between my show and most. I use journalists and broadcasters. Which I love to interview. Oh, yeah. Because they not only have something to say, they can say it. Thank you. Whereas the callers... <laughs> sometimes they can't. Sometimes can. leave a lot to be That's done. why I'm here talking to you, not. Papa, because you're, you're, you're a radio guy. and I mean, callers are great, too. Don't get me wrong. Callers are wonderful. Yeah. Now, what kind of calls do you like getting the most? Just somebody who knows what they're talking about, basically, right? People that disagree with me. Oh, okay. That's my favorite kind of call. Okay. I, I like destroying. No. no. <laughs> I, I, what I do is I like, I like the debate. Okay. I took debate in school. Sure. And uh, I've always been an argumentative type. So it works for me on radio. And the guys who disagree with you, you'd almost put them to the head of the line. And then people tell me, oh, Papa, you're wonderful. Oh, you're right again. Oh, yeah. uh, so what? Who wants to hear that? I yeah, mean, I know. People want to hear me. Oh, you're a bag of wind. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to straighten you out on this. That, to me, is, is the best kind of call. I don't think anybody ever turns off a call that begins, uh, you know, you got to shut up or something like that. Then you get into a good debate on sports. Sure. And there's nothing better. Absolutely. Now, you left Sporting News Radio a few years ago. What exactly happened there? Why'd you leave? The climate. That was that was the easiest call I ever made. I was 10 years in Chicago with Sporting News, and they pushed the contract across the table to me, and were renewing me for three years. And I said no. I said I'll do the show for you from Las Vegas. And they had let me come here and do a month at a time here and there because they knew I loved Las Vegas. But they uh, said they wouldn't stipulate. So I said have a good life. Wow. And uh, it was a it was a amicable parting. Although after I left, there. Uh, their fortunes went straight downhill. Now, that's not my ego talking so much as the, as the truth. And they, they made a couple other programming moves that I didn't like. But uh, yeah, it was just that, the climate. And you see it, you see the winter we have here. Right. You're, you're in Las Vegas. Here in LA. Although it's chillier. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, yeah. I was, I was yeah. driving around last night uh, in uh, Las Vegas. We're taping here Sunday, February 15th. Last night was actually uh, Valentine's Day and I'm driving down streets in Las Vegas. 42 degrees around midnight. So that's uh, that, that, that's what's changed a lot. Now, of course, okay. when you were on Sporting News Radio, you were heard all over the U.S., including, of course, Los Angeles. You were heard on 1540 AM, Chicago, New York. You were on AM 620. So you covered a lot of stations when you were on Sporting News Radio. Oh, we were, I was on it one point almost 400 stations. Wow. And uh, we we still get good callers from Los Angeles. I still have regular callers there you from go. L.A. Once they, excuse me, found me on the internet, they remain loyal. There you and, go. And uh, we've got a lot of fans uh, all over the country. We still get calls from New York, Chicago, and um, as, as now as we syndicate the show again, which what we're doing now here is now syndicating the show nationally out of here. Plus, we're already on the the internet and we're on Sports Byline Network. How do you syndicate a show? You call them up and say, hey, you want Papa? Basically it. And then, then they have to check their schedule. If they, First, if they have to like you, they have to want you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these stations are familiar with me because I was on, and they, I think they made money on me selling the local spots and all that. And as we get up and running and start selling these affiliates, I think we'll, we'll, I don't know whether we'll ever get back to 400 or not. Maybe we will. I hope we do. Sure. But, uh, and Los Angeles is a great market. I hope we get on in Los Angeles. You, were, you, you got a lot of calls from LA. Because oh, I remember you say, and now let's go to Joe in Los Angeles. He listens on 1540 yeah, you know, or something sure, like that. Sure. Where do you feel radio in general is headed? Well, again, with the uh, mention of the uh, internet, I, you know, I, I think it still has legs. And I think, see, because of the automobile, as long as you can listen in your car, what else are you going to do? You're going to listen to radio. And uh, unless the Internet can intrude on that or will intrude on that very much, radio will be on solid ground. I, I really think it is. Satellite radio, I don't think, is ever going to, I don't think it's ever going to hurt uh, terrestrial radio because I don't think you can, you know, people want to drop F-bombs or whatever they want to say on, ra on the satellite. That only goes so far. That that wears out real quick. Plus, people don't want to pay for radio. No, I mean, no. they're not used to paying for radio, and that's what. How about sports talk radio? Where's that headed? Again, I think it c can do well if it's done right, if it's done intelligently, if it's if it's going to be the loudest screamer or the most obscene 
or the guy who talks about everything but sports. Thank you. Those guys, I, I don't think, are doing not only the business, but us ourselves any good at all. Because people go, oh, you hear comedians mocking sports talk because they hear those kind of, they hear, hear that kind of stuff. So, again, as long as they're selective and as long as they keep finding, uh, again, smart sports talk, I don't think there'll be a problem. You know, one thing we were talking about, you know, there's all kinds of sports talk. There's guy talk, there's girl talk, there's smack talk. And somehow I, I get turned off when I hear, like, someone interviewing John Wooden let's say, the great basketball coach at UCLA, and someone goes, hey, John, that was a great win the other night by UCLA, huh? I mean, to me, that just doesn't do it. I, I like to hear, John, that was a terrific win, UCLA. What's your thoughts? You know, yeah. Something like that, you know. I, well, I, I mean, the loud screamers, I'm, I'm, yeah. When it starts to sound like college radio, and if you're familiar with college radio, it's kids just breaking into the business. They don't know it. They're nervous. And what overcomes the nerves is screaming or laughing or doing anything but making a point. All right. Now, what is it that you hear sports? I, I know you, you just mentioned though that you don't listen to sports talk radio, but over the years in listening, what is it that you heard sports talk radio hosts of the past and today do that you don't like? Well, uh, let me just start with wh where I started listening as a youngster. This is no insult to Eddie Andelman, but I used to listen to Eddie Andelman Sports Huddle in Boston when I was a young man. I used to listen to that. And I got a kick out of it. They'd have three, I don't know if you're familiar with the sports huddle. It may be the first sports talk show. It, certainly among the very first. He'd have four or five guys around a table. And they'd be uh, sometimes screaming at each other, but certainly arguing. And it was always fun to listen to. And I've gotten a, gotten a chance to tell Eddie that I started off listening to him. And he got a kick out of that. But um, there, was, there were a couple of other shows I listened to. But it wasn't very popular when, when I was young. Not you, but when I was young. There wasn't very much sports talk. Finally, Papa Joe, what is special about your sports talk show that keeps people listening and calling in? Take as much time as you need. What I hear from people, and what I believe is true, is that we're friend, we're friendly. They believe they're talking to a, a good guy who's friendly with them. Even if I, if, even if I go Yankees, pooey, I, <laughs> I get Yankee calls. Cowboys, pooey, I get cowboy calls. They, they think they're talking to a fair, good guy, okay? And I think after a period of time, they almost feel like a family. Though your listeners uh, treat you as almost a family member. And they know where you're going. They know what will push your buttons. They know what won't. And uh, I think that's being fair and being uh, a friend. Uh, you know, take, taking everybody seriously, even if their, their point might be ridiculous, you at least say, now, why don't you look at it another way? Why? And you try to work them around that way. It's not always successful, but you always try to do that if you can. i got to thank you so much for spending all this time with thank me. You. Talking here with Papa Joe Chevalier, the great sports talk radio host across America. If you have any comments or suggestions on the presentation you just heard, please call 818-780-2270. Or you could email... J. A. Lindstrom 25 at gmail.com. Thank you.